Hi, it's Nikki. Thank you for coming in for video two from my Dwarven Path to Glory army. We've already done two videos about Path to Glory. One was where I did a uh, chaotic live stream about trying to make my Dwarven army for the first time. And that was both fun and terrifying and kind of all over the place. Then I did another one where I worked with my friend Michael Olinsky to make his Flesh Eater course Path to Glory. And I felt that was at least a much better video. But I needed to come back and be able to fill out the rest of my Path of Glory army that I didn't fill in. All the nice little narrative things that we're playing narrative for, so we might as well go ahead and do that. So, I was thinking about my army, and one thing, there's two things that Warhammer Dwarves are known for. Living underground and making alcohol. And I always liked the idea of the Dwarven Ranger in old fantasy, where they we looked at as the, these uh, crazy dwarves that they were having too much fresh air, as of like there's not cabin fever that dwarves have, right? There's there's fresh air fever, and so I always liked the idea of the Overland Dwarf Ranger, and that kind of fit a little bit with doing a Living City Gyron type of thing, so. I decided, you know, I'm going to play up the alcohol-making aspect of the dwarves. I'm going to make them like this overland uh, city known for a uh, lot of taverns, a great nightlife, that kind of thing. And so since it's in the living city, and that's kind of known for Gyran for being a place full of trees and whatnot, I was going to call it something like the, uh, the brewery in the woods. And I was looking up the old Kazalid language for the dwarves in fantasy. And they do have something like that. And so I started to call the name of my city Thingus Valdehas, which is meant to be the old Kazalid for like the Deep Woods Brewery. And I thought that was pretty cool. And if you have a Deep Woods Brewery, you better also have probably a wood-like stronghold, or at least something kind of calling out for that. And of course there was always this idea in the old fantasy, and it kind of carried over a little bit to the mortal realms, right? The idea of uh, Iron Oak. Uh, we have the Iron Oak Sylvaneth, which, by the way, since this is a living city, uh, Sylvaneth are allies. If I bring in Sylvaneth allies for my army, they're going to be Iron Oak related. So that's kind of really cool. And I wanted a name for the keep that I was going to have, and Iron Oak is called Wutrith. So I was looking up for Dwarven Wards for, like, the Iron Oak Keep. And I got Wutruth Kazad, or Wutruth Kazad. I'm not sure which way you're going to pronounce it. I can probably look that one up on Total War Warhammer and find out from that way. Speaking of which, that was an immense resource for me for this, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So, that's the name of the keep. I also need to have a name for what my Forgotten Mine is supposed to be. And this was actually fairly easy to be able to do. I was kind of cheeky with my name for this one. I decided to call my mine the Aldong Groong. Aldong Groong. Which is supposed to be Warhammer Fantasy Kazalid for the old mine. That's it. So, not the most creative thing there, but it sounds kind of cool. And that was at least then what I did with this. So that fills in that part. Now we need to get to the order of battle and get to the different names of the things I have. And one of the things I've been doing with my little generator here, or my Path to Glory Excel spreadsheet here, is I actually want to have kind of a name generator. And I've only got two of them in here so far. I've uh, not getting around to yet finishing off a bunch of the other things. And this is where Total War Warhammer was really coming handy because I was able to use a lot of the names from the name file from that to help make some of these names possible, especially having a large list as I try and update it more and more as I read through like old White Dwarves and old campaign books for uh, different Warhammer armies and things from that. And we can take a look and see what this happens here because I have at least an Auric and a Gitz name generator and a Duarden name generator right now. And so we can see that we have, say, for the Oryx, Grizz Guts Nox <laughs> Noxotus. Duarden name, we have Gutri Gundrickson. Or how about Oryx Morglus and Dwarf Loon Ironhammer? So there's a lot of different names that you can be able to come up with this. Oh, here goes one. Alaric Death Dealer. 
Actually, Alaric is such a funny thing because I would try to name my first son by that name, and the wife was not going to go for that one, which was unfortunate because I was trying to go for that old Germanic barbarian thing, and I was like, let's go for the name for the barbarian that sacked Rome. That did not go over very well. But anyway, I'm a big fan of the name Alaric, by the way. So that's my dwarf name generator. So I actually generated some names for my dwarfs. And so for my warlord, I got Thorgrim. That was kind of interesting since, you know, the main dwarf in uh, the leader of the dwarves, and that is Thorgrim in there. But this one was actually, he got himself a little epithet attached to him, right? And so he was Thorgrim, the Dark Bringer, which, since this is narrative, this gives me a wonderful opportunity to figure out how does this guy get this name? Why is the Warden King of the Brewery of the Deep Woods called the Dark Bringer? So that was go going to be kind of interesting. We have here that for the Rune Lord, I came up with the name Drong, the Prophet of Renald. For the Cogsmith, we had Herger Oathkeeper over here. And then we were going to get to the other units. Now the Hammers are a big unit, a group of uh, people. I was patterning them off of the old Rangers. I actually converted mine to have axes instead of big hammers. And they're painted with greens, and I had some little satchels from the uh, Judicator Stormcast models that I was able to put on them. And, and so I was able to kind of make the idea of the great weapon, weapon dwarf rangers wielding axes, because you're going to go and take axes out into the woods. You're not going to take hammers out into the woods, I think. Makes sense to me. Anyway, so I needed a name for my hammers, and I actually came up with another cheeky little name from here. I have a friend who's in a pirate band that they like to sing little shanties, and one of the songs that they're actually the best singing at is The Wild Rover. I love listening to them sing The Wild Rover. So I decided to get a little punny, and I called my group of hammer rangers the Wald Rovers. The Forest Rovers. I know. Ha 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 ha. Tee hee. Anyway, gyro bombers. This was actually another cool moment that I could have for narrative stuff because gyro bombers and gyrocopters are essentially piloted by one pilot. So I can just give them the name of the pilot, and that's kind of like another singular person that's working under the army of Thingas Valda has that you can kind of build a little bit of a story around. And so I had two gyro bomber names. I had for one Malgo Stonebeard. And then for the other one, I had Valor Knucklebreaker. And that's my army. So I mentioned I had my first battle, and it was against the Soul Black Grave Lords. And I thoroughly enjoyed it because at least one thing is I love about playing with dwarves is the idea that they hold these grudges, right? And they got the grudge book, and you know, there's always the joke like, you know, you you you, you have hurt my pride. It's going into the book. And so I was playing these dwarves kind of like that, which is fine because I got my butt, uh, butt kicked up and down. It was a very frustrating game for my opponent, though. And we'll get into a little bit about why that for a second. But I actually made a narrative for it. So let's go ahead. Let's watch the narrative. And then we'll come back and we'll go over the battle and the aftermath of it. Warden King Thorgrim sent his forces far and wide in search of productive lands to claim to sustain the growth of Thingis Valda has. Gyro bomber Mulgo Stonebeard observed several small farmsteads, ruined, ransacked, and devoid of activity, while scouting south for such fertile lands. Something full befield these folk. I've got to airport this back to Ithkin. Thorgrim consulted his closest advisors, Runelord Drong, the Prophet, and Cogsmith Herger Oathkeeper. Herger deduced the farms follow a path from an unknown origin from the south and advised Thorgrim on likely spots of future similar events. Runelord Drong counseled. Rumors say the lands stay the Sither controlled by Zanguzes. I'll reckon those empty homesteads are sign a trespassers fray those blighted lands. Herger's maps shows the path that death is heading towards an old temple a order. I can draw power fray a place of faith tour pal them fray get nae close a tae thing is Volta has, or disturbing the peace a the Sylvaneth. Thorgrim decides to set a trap there. Let's lure them into an ambush, and the might of the throng of fingers Valda has sharp it to stalk tar these trespassers. Warden Thorgrim and the Wall Rovers Rangers waited among the hidden paths of the woods around the derelict temple. 
Gyro bombers Mulgo Stonebeard and Valor Knucklebreaker flew above the time-worn sanctuary, hoping the forest canopy obscures their presence. Upon a small bluff before a shallow bog stood Drong and Herger. Drong prayed, Mighty Sigmar, Forgotten Valire, and Raynal, grant you the blessings and protection of the faith thou pulled this shrine, so thou were as stubborn as eat. A rune of remembrance was inked within an arcane tome he carried, to better coax power from the refuge. An undead horde approaches from the south, zombified wolves grown large on necromantic magic, shambling skeletons, blood knights upon skeletal steeds, and a proud vampire floating gracefully above the ground, so that their feet may not be sullied by the dirt beneath. Thorgrim springs his trap and a mighty clash ensues. The undead hordes are stopped from approaching any closer to Thingis Valdahas, but the inimical mission the undead lord remains unknown. Thorgrim's throng returns to Thingis Valdahas, and Thorgrim demands grudges be recorded. So that was the battle. And now we're going to go ahead and deal with the aftermath. I actually have a lot of this already put into my little Excel sheet here, so we can go ahead and just talk about it, though. Uh, here's the battle. My first one, we played the trap. I was actually playing against my friend Malone. Uh, he already showed up uh, here one time to talk about a match he had against the Beast Claw Raiders. My general, of course, was Thorgrim. He was bringing Castellet Dynasty with his general's name being Julian von Drakenberg. So this is game one for me, and here's how our battle rounds went. The trap was interesting because, and narrative ones are like this, right? Narrative are going to have these very oddball ways of doing victory points. And the idea is that my opponent has so many army forces on the board, and they're going to get victory points as long as their army's alive. I need to kill them. And so I kind of actually have a clock, because there's a certain point where... Me tabling his army will never catch up to the amount of points he generates. And we can see that right here. So in the first turn, he had four units that he played with for the game. And they all lived in the first turn. I killed none of them. Second turn, they all lived in the first. By the second turn, I killed none of them. Third turn, I finally kill one. So he gets three points because his three of his four units are still alive. And I get two points for killing one unit. And so we're at, he's 11 versus my 2. If I was to even attempt to kill the rest of his army, it was never going to be happen. It was never going to happen because the maximum I could really only ever get for that is uh, 8 points. Now let's see, I think I'm actually a little bit wrong here on my math real quick. Uh, let's see, I should be here. 2 victory points. And two victory points. I should be only at eight, not eight, six total. Let's see. Some. Ah, here we go. Some of this here. Fix my machine, fix my Excel spreadsheet, right, as we're in the middle of doing this one right here. So I finished the fight with six victory points because I can only kill three of his units. He finishes the fight with. 14, let's see, yeah, 14 points. So it's a loss for me. I only have six victory points. He has 14. I have fun on it the entire time because I'm a dwarf and dwarves and cities just by themselves, especially if I'm not trying to be uh, the best of them. Running gyro bombers is terrible, but gyro bombers went in kind of with the theme that I wanted to have with them. And so... Uh, I was going to lose. What was very frustrating for my opponent from Malone was that he was actually rolling very bad that entire night. And so he was winning, even though he wasn't winning by any skill of his. He was just winning because my army couldn't beat him. And they naturally weren't going to beat him, but he was rolling bad all night and so it kept my army kind of competitive. He should have been able to probably, yeah, table me by turn three. And he just couldn't. And that was very frustrating for him. So we're in this weird dichotomy, right? And this is kind of what I say about narrative is it's not about winning. It's about making a story. Because by winning, 
he could win and hate it the entire time. And I was losing and I was loving it the entire time because his ability to win was just entirely tied to my ability to win. He, there was no need for skill for him. Uh, if I could not beat him up, he was winning. So there was kind of really no need for interactivity almost for the fight with that one. It was, so it was very frustrating for him then because of that. Anyway, so we get to the aftermath of the battle, right? We start going through all the different things. So I scored six glory points for that fight. Uh, I got four for, uh, no, I got five for doing the fight and an extra one because my general was on the board at the time and he was alive at the end of it. Injury wise, uh, my cogsmith went down, but he came back okay. Uh, the hammerers unit though, they lost their entire unit and so I had to roll casualties for them. I rolled three ones, no, four ones at the time. No, three ones, three ones. Yeah, three ones at the time. And I was able to spend one of my glory points to be able to roll one die to see if I could not roll another one, and I did. So I only just stuck with two casualty points for that moment. Uh, I was going to spend another two glory points in order to roll recuperation for my unit. That is, I roll the number of casualties they have and every four up, one of them comes back. I didn't roll anything four or higher on two dice. So I was stuck with two casualties. I did at least name my hammerers, the Wald Rovers, as my favorite warriors. So that way they were able to get some extra renown. And by doing that, it was you roll a D6 and you give them renown based on the d6. They lost the fight. They they were out they were knocked out of the fight, so they did not get a renown for staying alive. Uh, I rolled a 6, so they were actually able to gain a rank and they became a veteran group of people. And I was able to give them a veteran ability on top of that. My quest was scouting fertile lands, which I completed, and I regret having making that one my uh, my initial because when I made it my initial request, I did not realize how much it would cost in glory to bring in any new lands. And I was not going to be bringing in any new lands by the end of this fight. I wasn't. So even though I completed the quest, there was no benefit to me completing the quest. Except now I could choose a new one. And then I started actually looking at the quests I could have. And I decided to go with defending the realm. Because it's a way for me to be able to build up the glory... I need to be able to fuel my army to get it to a point that I'm going to feel kind of happy about with it. So I at least had my six glory points that I gained. I was at 11. I'm going to be minus one for saving one of my walled rovers. I'm going to be at another minus two for trying to recuperate the walled rovers and that didn't work out. And I'm going to finish the fight with eight glory points. And I think I'm okay with that there's maybe a couple of other things i'll be spending it on but i'm okay with that right now because some of the things that i can be able to do like a barracks or something like that i, I can't do and don't want to do because i don't need any of the slots it's going to be able to give me let's see i fought one battle i completed one quest and when i fought malone's army i did kill julian von drakenberg so i was able to slay at least one hero and then over here at the Order of Battle, I got four Renown points for Thorgrim, putting him at 19 Renown. Drong survived the battle, and as long as your unit survives a battle, they're going to get a Renown point. The Cogsmith actually died, but we all saw that in the story. And then we have the Rovers. They died, but I rolled a six because they were my favorite warriors, so they have six Renown. Malgo survived. My gyro bombers, both of them did. And so I'm going to get renowned points for both of them. Now for the hammerers, since they're above five renown, they get to get a veteran ability. And I decided to give them devastating charge because I want a lot of my hammerers action to be that they're going to hide in the, hide in the forested paths. They're going to be an ambush type unit. The warden king's going to be with them. And so I want them to 
basically jump out nine inches away from people and charge. And so Devastating Charge is going to help put more damage out from them to make them more devastating on the attack after I can spring a trap with them. Now I need to find a way to get the charge boosted up with them. But they at least get plus one because they have they have the musician in there. So I only just need to roll an eight, and I get two chances to be able to do that. So I'm hoping half half the percent of the time half the time when rolling two dice. You're either going to get a seven or lower or seven or higher. A seven's the most common combination for two dice rolling two D6s. And so I'm hoping I'm going to get that higher than seven number on two rolls. At least more often than not. We'll find out though. All right. So I think that's actually everything to do with this army. So thank you for taking a look and see how Path of Glory works a little bit more. Kind of what the aftermath of it is about and some of the things that you can be, to, be able to do with it afterwards uh we'll go ahead and come back once when i have another fight too and we can talk about that have a good day um, so again once again thank you to my patrons evelyn Dakoti and lynette mahira bye